hello guys, thank you so much for uh, joining this talk on Parkinson's disease by Bridging the Gap. We'll just make, um, we'll just wait till um, five past just to make sure that everyone else gets a chance to join. And yeah, we'll start at five past. Okay, I think we'll get started. So welcome back guys to Bridging the Gap. So today's talk will be on Parkinson's disease by Irene and Garishma, who are both finally medical students at the Medical University of Varna. So we'll try and make it as interactive as possible. So if you guys don't mind just typing in the chat what the um, answers could be and um, doing the polls, that would be much appreciated. Um, and yeah, towards the end of the session, I'll post in the feedback link. So if you fill it in, you'll get a certificate of attendance as well as a copy of the slides. And don't think there's anything else to say. So I'll hand it over to Greshma and Irene. Um, hi, guys. So I'm Greshma. I'm Irene. And we're going to get started. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so Parkinson's disease, uh, it's a condition where there is progressive reduction of dopamine in the basal ganglia of the brain. And this is what leads to the disorders of movement. So the symptoms are characteristically asymmetrical and um, with one side affected more than the other. And it typically presents in patients over the age of 55 years old. And it has a prevalence of one to 2% in people over 65 and it, this rises with age. There's a higher prevalence of Parkinson's um, in men uh, with a male to female ratio of 1.5 to 1. So the reduction in dopaminergic output is what um, results in the uh, classical triad of features. So does what is the classical triad that we see in Parkinson's? Does anyone know? Mm. Mm. You can type it in the chat or you can just say it too. You can use the picture to help. Is 
rigidity, rigidity tremor and slow oh, shuffling shit. gait. Okay. Um, okay. So the, yeah. So um, the triad is pill rolling tremor, cogwheel rigidity and bradykinesia. So we're going to look at a case now. Um, a 60 year old female experienced a fall in her kitchen suddenly. Her family members told her that she was not smiling and had a straight expressionless face in any situation. She also had difficulty in writing and her speech became soft and slurred. It came to the notice of the lady that there was a slowness in her movements and she was taking more time in her routine activities than needed. She visited her family physician for a routine checkup and presented her problems to him. She was immediately referred to contact a neurologist. Um, okay, so uh, we'll come back to the case as we go through um, the slides. So Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis. So taking a thorough history is very important. Um, so can does anyone know what symptom um, it shows in this picture that's associated with Parkinson's? Slip someone's in my yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's correct. So um, when we take the history, we need to ask about the symptoms. Uh, because it's a clinical diagnosis, we need to be very specific. Um, so what kind of, what symptoms would you ask about? So micrography is one. Anything else? Mast phase, yeah. Any other guesses, guys? Just put it onto the chat. Tremors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, um, like someone said. So we'll ask about the motor symptoms. And um, so you'd ask the patient if they have um, slow movements, if they notice any stiffness in their movements, if they um, have a tremor, like mentioned, uh, if they um, have instability or if they have falls recently. Um, you'd also ask about their dexterity. Um, you'd also ask about autonomic symptoms. For example, if they have constipation, if they feel lightheaded when standing, if they have experienced excessive salivation or sweating, or if they have urinary or sexual dys dysfunction as well. Um, then you'd ask about the mood and cognitive symptoms. Um, so you would ask if they have low mood or anxiety, apathy, uh, et cetera. Uh, you'd ask about their sleep, if they've uh, experienced any increase in daytime sleepiness, uh, if they've uh, noticed anosmia or reduced sense of smell. Um, you'd also ask about their um, REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is when this manifests with behaviors like punching, kicking, or shouting during sleep. And they might also have altered handwriting, which is micrographia. That is what we can see in the picture here. Okay, so um, what other history would you take? So you've done all the symptoms, and now what else would you ask? Both medical history, family history. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Okay, so um, so you'd ask about the past medical history. So if they've had any history of uh, tremors before or any movement disorders, if they have frequent falls, this is very important. Um, you would ask about drug history. Um, so this is uh, important to exclude drug-induced Parkinsonism. Uh, we'll come back to that later. We'd also ask about the family history. So even though um, Parkinson's is an idiopathic disease, um, it does have to, uh, it does seem to have some genetic association uh, of, especially if they have a first degree relative with the Parkinson disease diagnosis. So um, we should definitely ask about this. And then social history. So smoking is thought to be protective, but alcohol withdrawal is a common cause of trauma. So we'd ask about that too. And then, okay, so even though, 
there's no known causes, there are some risk factors. So um, what do you guys think are the three main risk factors for Parkinson's? We, I didn't mention some in the previous slide. Yeah, so that's right. So being male, increased age, um, and first degree relative, so family history, that's right. So these are the risk factors that we would ask for in history taking. So this is, um, so our patient's history. Our patient has a history of depression. Uh, she also uh, suffered malaria a couple of times. She was independent in her activities, but recently she was facing issues regarding her balance and inability to participate in some activities. She was also very tired during the day, even though she gets enough sleep at night. She also um, she's all, she's also says she is often constipated. She does not have any relatives with Parkinson's. And when asked about social history, she replied that she does not smoke or drink. So based on our um, on the previous slide, what uh, symptoms can you see here that this patient has? Depression mm -hmm. is a cognitive symptom. Yeah, that's right. Um, so she has depression. Um, she is constipated. Um, so the other ones are that she um, balance. Yeah. So. Why does it say balance? No, this. Yeah, but uh, she's. Okay, so she has the inability to participate. Yeah, and she's also very tired during the day, so excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. Okay. Uh, so differentials of Parkinson's. Okay, so does anyone know any differentials of Parkinson's disease? So think about other diseases with similar symptoms. Cerebellar disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, so I've listed a few here. So one is Lewy body dementia. And so this is a type of dementia that is associated with features of Parkinsonism. So it causes a cognitive decline and their associated dementia like symptoms. So for example, hallucinations or delusions. Um, then we have multi-system atrophy. So this is rare, but it's where the neurons in the brain degenerate. So it affects multiple systems in the brain. So one of the areas that affects is the basal ganglia. That's what leads to the Parkinson's presentation, but it can also um, affect other areas. For example, um, the cerebellum causing cere cerebellar dysfunction, which causes ataxia. It can also affect um, autonomic. Uh, it can also cause autonomic dysfunction, and this can lead to uh, constipation or abnormal sweating or a postural hypotension. Yeah, so cerebellar dysfunction and autonomic dysfunction as well. So um, there's also drug induced Parkinsonism. So I was going to ask what drugs cause it, but I forgot to do the animation. So antipsychotics can cause uh, drug induced Parkinsonism. Uh, so it's mostly um, first generation, such as uh, haloperidol, um, as opposed to second generation antipsychotics, uh, anti-emetics can also cause um, drug induced Parkinsonism. And another differential is essential tremor. So this is, these are all very important to rule out. 
So the first two, this is known as Parkinson's plus syndromes. So doesn't anyone know what Parkinson's plus syndrome is, or it's also known as Parkinsonism? Does anyone know what it is and how it defers to Parkinson's disease? No, this is okay so okay so parkinson's plus syndrome is characterized by primary features of parkinson's disease such as bradykinesia ataxia and resting tremor and rigidity but it also has um some additional features and we'll go into more detail about that on the next slide um okay so how can we differentiate between drug-induced parkinsonism essential tremor and parkinson's so so for drug-induced, um, the motor symptoms are generally rapid onset and they are bilateral. So this is very important to remember because in Parkinson's, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the symptoms are unilateral or it's more prominent in on one side, whereas drug-induced, the tremor will be on both sides. Um, and in this case, rigidity and resting tremor are uncommon. So uh, it might happen, but it's very uncommon. And for essential tremor, to rule out um, essential tremor, so again, it's um, symmetrical, whereas Parkinson's tremor is asymmetrical, and it's four to six hertz uh, for Parkinson's tremor, uh, whereas essential tremor is five to eight hertz. Um, with Parkinson's, the tremor will be worse uh, when resting, whereas with uh, essential tremor, uh, it will be it will improve when the patient rests. And with Parkinson's, this improves with intentional movement, whereas this worsens with intentional movements. Um, and with Parkinson's, they'll have other Parkinson's features, um, such as rigidity or bradykinesia, whereas in this case, they only have the tremor, they have no other features. And this uh, Parkinson's does not change with alcohol, whereas benign essential tremor improves with alcohol. Okay, so Parkinsonism versus Parkinson's disease. So um, this is also known as atypical Parkinsonism or Parkinson's plus syndrome. So uh, like I said before, they have the main um, motor symptoms such as tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. But um, Parkinsonism is a general term that refers to a group of neurological um, disorders that causes movement disorders similar to Parkinson's. Um, so in Parkinson's, they may have other, many other motor symptoms can occur, and they can also have non-motor symptoms like cognitive changes, depression, anxiety, um, hallucinations or delusions. Um, the patient may have sleeping problems or um, swallowing, chewing and speaking difficulty. They may have uh, urinary or constipation problems as well. Whereas in this case, um, even though other symptoms, other symptoms occur, but it's generally not the ones that are seen in Parkinson's disease, um, they're uh, based on the form of the Parkinson's plus syndrome. So the six most common forms are multiple, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal syndrome, dementia with Lewy bodies, drug-induced Parkinsonism, and vascular Parkinsonism. Okay, so when we do... So I'm finding it hard next. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the PowerPoint will be sent out after. Okay, so for physical exam, on um, general inspection, what would you be looking out for? Any features that we discussed earlier that you would see on general inspection? Yep, worsening tremors at rest, resting tremor, yep. Okay, so we'll go through it. Yep, cogwheel rigidity, yes. So um, with the face, what might you see? I think someone said it earlier. We said, uh, someone said masked face, it's also known as, yep, uh, hypomimia. 
um, you might see um, anything with the blinking. So with the blinking, you might see less and infrequent blinking. Um, and with speech, you might um, um, you ask them to talk. And then you'll hear hypophonia. Um, does anyone know what glabella tapis trap test and the myosin, uh, myosin sign? Bella tap test. Okay, so this test is when you tap the glabella and in normal patients, um, when you uh, continue tapping, they will blink the first few times whereas uh, and then stop blinking, whereas in uh, patients with Parkinson's, they will continue to um, uh, blink. So this is the myosin sign that will be positive in those with Parkinson's. Anything with their posture, what will their posture be like? Yep, yeah, hunched over, yeah, the stooped over, yes. And you can, like someone said, the resting tremor, also their gait. Does anyone know what the gait is in this case? Yep, yeah, shuffling, that's right. So yeah, I think we mentioned most of the symptoms, the stooped posture, you will see the masked face and the forward tilt of the trunk. Um, you, you have reduced arm swing. Does anyone know why they have a reduced arm swing when they're walking? Yeah the rigidity, so they have increased tone of the muscle. They will have a hand tremor, and they will be slightly flexed at the hip and the knees, and they will have the shuffling short step gait. So the glabella tap is when you tap the glabella con uh, uh, continuously, and in patients, normal patients, they will blink the first few times, and then they will um, stop blinking. Whereas um, in those with Parkinson's, they will continue to blink. Um, there's a video on YouTube if you guys want to see um, what it looks like, the positive sign looks like. Um, okay, carrying on, they will have tremor in the legs um, and so on. So what's, um, or what of these symptoms are important to assess in those with Parkinson's? Yep, so the tremors, the gait, yeah. So like Grashma said, the triad, so you have um, bradykinesia, uh, the cogwheel rigidity, the resting tremor, uh, the shuffling gait. Um, you can also test postural instability as well. So the bradykinesia or the hypokinesia, what is, it, uh, what is this? Yep, slow movements. So it's slowness in, yeah, poor or slow movement. So it's slowness in the initiation of voluntary movement with um, progressive reduction um, of the speed during repetitive action. So how might you test this in a patient? Any ideas? Yeah, the hand test, telling them to repeat the turn in their hands. Yep, yeah, that's one of them. Yeah, it's called the pronation supination test. You can also do finger tapping and there's others as well like toe tapping. So you, you would ask them to perform rapid alternating movements around 10 to 20 times. What would you look out for while they're performing these? What are the features you, you are looking out for? Yep, gradually slow down or stop, yep. So you would test both hands as well. So 
So we'll go ahead. Um, so yeah, look for progressive reduction in the speed, um, reduction in the amplitude for asymmetry. For example, the left hand might be slower than the right hand. Um, slowness in the initiation of movement as well. Moving on to tremor, I think everyone knows, but what is the tremor most often seen in Parkinson's? Yeah, the pill rolling or the resting tremor. So it's most marked at rest. And it occurs at 46 hertz. What does this mean that it occurs at 46 hertz? Low frequency. <laughs> So it means that it will happen to the, they will do it for 46 times per second. That's what the 46 Hertz means. So you can watch and see how many times they do it. Um, it's worse when they're stressed or tired and improves with voluntary movement. It actually begins distally. So in the fingers, hands or forearms, and it can involve the chin and the mouth as well. So, and it's asymmetrical. Remember this is important because in um, essential, um, tremors mm -hmm. they are and bilateral. drug induced as well and uh, drug induced they're bilateral um you can also see action um, tremors in parkinson's it's less commonly associated um there are two types you have the postural the postural um which occurs during the maintenance of a position against gravity and worsens during active movement so how you can assess this is by um, asking the patient to raise their arms and spread their fingers and it might um, occur after a few seconds. This is known as um, a re-emergent tremor. Um, you can also have kinetic tremors. So this is usually during hand movements. There are two types. Um, you can have um, simple, which is when the tremor remains um, throughout the movement. You can also have intentional. So this is when it gets worse as the patient approaches the target. So you can do a finger nose test or get them to write. And uh, for example, if they have intentional, um, it will get worse as they move their finger closer to the nose. And so you would know any obvious tremor, but if it's not obvious, you would ask the patient to close their eyes and count from count down from 20 to distract them. Because as we know, the resting tremors um, um, occurs when they are at rest. Okay, so next we have tone. Um, in uh, Parkinson's, is the tone of the muscle increased or decreased? Yeah, increased. And what are the disturbances of tone that you know, the two types, main types? Yes, rigidity and spasticity. Um, so do you guys know um, which one is associated with um, Parkinson's? And why? Yep, so the cogger rigidity, yes. Um, so um, the rigidity is actually velocity independent. So that means um, the movement, the, uh, the it feels the same way if you move the limb rapidly or slowly, whereas spasticity is actually velocity independent. Uh, uh, dependent. So the faster you move the limb, the worse the um, uh, the, the rigidity is. And then um, spasticity, spasticity is um, associated with pyramidal tract lesions, so like stroke, and rigidity is associated with extra pyramidal lesions, so Parkinson's. So you have two types of rigidity. You have cogwheel and lead pipe. And um, cogwheel uh, is usually when the tremor is superimposed on the hypotonia. So it results in um, intermittent increases in tone during the movement of the limb. So this is what's seen in Parkinson's. And then you have lead pipe rigidity, which um, involves, which uniformly involves increased tone throughout the movement of the muscle. And this is most often seen in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, um, which we'll discuss later on. Um, 
Um, how would you assess tone in your patient? Any ideas? Yeah, so TFB19 is right for tone. Um, so you would um, hold the patient's arm and elbow, and then you ask them to relax and allow you to control the the movement of their arm and then you move all the muscle groups of the shoulder the elbow and the wrist you test the full range of motion and you feel for any abnormalities of the tone so you might feel for spasticity or rigidity on cogwheeling and um, cogwheeling will feel like um, a tension in the arm that gives away um, to movements in small small jerks or for hypotonia as well and finally we have gait so for gait, you would ask the patient to walk up and down the room. So earlier we said we are we look for the shuffling gait. Um, so this is so the shuffling is due to reduced stride length, and they might be hesitant, so difficulty initiating and turning. Um, uh, so multiple steps. They might have um, they might be fascinating. So this is when the patient walks faster and faster, not as to not fall over. You have the lack of arm swing due to the um, increased tone. This is an early sign, and you might see unsteadiness. So this is a tendency to fall forwards or backwards. You can also test for. Um, postural instability. So you can ask the patient to sit and stand up with their arms crossed where, in which they might be stable getting up and getting back down. And you can also do a pull test. So this is when you have the patient and you slightly tug at their shoulders and see if they can regain their balance. That's it. Okay, so the diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's. So it's diagnosed clinically based on the symptoms uh, and history taking and physical examination. So it should be uh, made only by a specialist with experience in diagnosing Parkinson's. But the NICE um, guidelines recommend using the UK Parkinson's Disease Society Brain Bank Clinical Diagnostic Criteria. So it's a very long name, but it's broken down into three steps. Um, so you can also do a dopamine active transporter scan. Um, these measure dopamine uptake in the basal ganglia, but these are very, very expensive. So it's only reserved for um, cases of diagnostic uncertainty. So the criteria is what we use. So there's three steps. So step one is um, diagnosis of Parkinsonian syndrome. So the patient would have to be have to present with bra bra bradykinesia and they should have at least one of the following. So they can have um, muscle rigidity, uh, a resting tremor or postural instability. So bradykinesia with one of these. And then uh, if that is present, then we'll move on to step two. So step two is the exclusion criteria for Parkinson's disease. So we would have to exclude um, all other causes of um, that are listed here that would cause um, Parkinson-like symptoms. So for example, if they've had a history of repeated strokes um, with stepwise progression of Parkinsonian features, or if they've had a history of repeated head injuries, or if they have cerebellar signs, or um, if they have um, a history of definite encephalitis, um, all of these would need to be ruled out. And then once that is done, we, we would move on to step three. And this is supportive prospective criteria for Parkinson's disease. So, uh, so out of all the ones listed here, we would need three or more um, to definite for definite diagnosis of Parkinson's. So um, if it's unilateral, if there's resting tremor, if it's progressive, so any three of these would suffice. So that is how you do the uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's. So moving on to management, for a patient, is there a cure? Yep, so there's no cure. Um, does anyone know what drugs you would prescribe? Yep. 
levodopa, dopaminergics. Yeah, so the treatment is focused on controlling the symptoms and minimizing the side effects. Um, and it's um, tailored to each individual pa uh, patient and their response to different medications. So the first line treatment um, is categorized based on the mo whether the motor symptoms um, affect affect the quality of life or not. So if they do, um, the, the drug that's recommended is levodopa. If they don't, um, you have options from dopamine agonists. So these are the non-ergot derived ones. Does anyone know why we give non-ergot derived first line? Any guesses to why the non ergot derived ones are preferred over the ergot derived ones? So simple, the um, non ergot ones are preferred because they're better tolerated and they have a better um, adverse event profile compared to the ergot derived ones. Um, you can also give levodopa or um, mono monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. So um, as we said earlier, the treatment is um, tailored to each individual. And this is usually done by a specialist rather than like a normal doctor. But the um, NICE uh, have made tables to try and help us understand um, how we should choose the drugs. So we have levodopa. So this is usually almost combined with a decarboxylase inhibitor. Does anyone know why this is the case? Yeah, that's right. So it won't be broken down before entering the blood brain barrier. Um, so the examples, does anyone know the examples of decarboxylase inhibitors you would give? Any examples? So you can give um, carbidopa or um, benzerazide, um, which Krishna will go into a bit later. So with the levodopa, it has the best improvement in motor symptoms and um, activities of daily living, um, but it does have more motor complications, most uh, commonly known as uh, dyskinesias, which Krishna will go into again. And they also have fewer specified adverse events like excessive sleepiness, hallucinations, impulse control disorders. And then we have dopamine um, agonists. Um, these have less improvement in motor symptoms and daily and activities of daily living, but they have fewer motor complications, but still more specified adverse events. And then we have the uh, mal B inhibitors, and they have less improvement in their motor symptoms and daily activities, but they have fewer motor complications and fewer adverse um, um, events as well. So if um, the patient is, the symptoms are not controlled on these first line um, treatment, you can add on um, an, some other drugs. Do you guys know what these drugs are? Any ideas? Yeah, propen roll, yeah. So that would be an example of a dopamine agonist. Do you know any drugs that you would add on if the symptoms are not controlled with 
these first line um, treatment options. So they would be um, they would be the catechol yep contented inhibitors like yeah and also amantadine. Uh, before we talk about these, um, do you guys know what the on and off phenomena is? The on and off phenomenon. So something that you have to um, consider in patients taking um, patients taking these drugs are the on and on and on and off phenomena. So the on time is when the levodopa the drugs are working well and the symptoms are controlled, and the off time is when they're no longer as effective no longer effective and they um, the symptoms start to re-emerge so that's important to consider as well so when you uh, you can add on these drugs um, if the initial drugs are not um, as effective yep i'm mad yes that's right so um, dopamine agonists have improvement in motor symptoms and daily activities and they also have a more off-time reduction um, so the off periods are lower and um, they also have um, intermediate risk of adverse events and but they do have a high risk of hallucinations then you have um, then you have the mal b inhibitors so there's improvement in motor symptoms and daily activities of living there is an off time uh, reduction they also have fewer adverse events and lower risk of uh, hallucinations then we have the COMPT inhibitors. Um, so they, there's an improvement in motor symptoms, activities of daily living. There is an off-time reduction as well, but they do have more adverse events and more risk of hallucinations. And then you have amantadine. So with this, um, the mechanism is not fully understood, but it does increase dopamine release. And um, there isn't much evidence that actually improves um, tremor and the other motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but it can be used to treat um, involuntary movements like dyskinesia if the other medications haven't been effective. So it's often prescribed when the others are not working any longer or as well, and it can also be used in other stages as well. Okay, so... We'll go into a bit more detail about the side effects of um, the medications. So the main side effect of levodopa is uh, when the dose is too high. Um, in this case, the patients will develop um, dyskinesia. So dyskinesia is uh, um, okay. So it's abnormal movements uh, that are associated with excessive motor activity. So when the dose of levodopa is too high. So this can be dystonia, uh, chorea, or apoptosis. So dystonia is when there's excessive muscle contraction, and this leads to abnormal posture or exaggerated movements. And uh, chorea is um, when there's abnormal involuntary movements like jerking um, of the limbs, arms, and legs. And apoptosis is uh, involuntary writhing movements. And this is often seen in um, of the uh, in the fingers or in the hands or the feet. Uh, it can also have other um, symptoms, uh, sorry, side effects like xerostomia or postural hypotension. So examples of levodopa uh, medications are uh, co carol dopa and co benol dopa. Um, yeah, so we also have uh, COMT inhibitors. So these can cause confusion and hallucinations and examples are endocapone, uh, dopamine agonists. So um, these... So a notable side effect of dopamine agonists is with uh, prolonged use, it causes pulmonary fibrosis, uh, but this is only with um, when it's been taken for a long time. So it can also cause other symptoms like excessive daytime sleepiness or impulse uh, control disorders. And examples are bromocryptine, uh, cabagoline, and primopexol. Okay, and then... Mal B inhibitors as well. These can cause serostomia, uh, hallucinations, or confusion. 
and examples as uh, silagiline and uh, rasagiline. And we also have uh, amantadine. This can cause ataxia, slurred speech, confusion, or dizziness. So um, impulse control disorders um, have been significant in recent years. So um, these can occur with any dopaminergic therapy, but um, they're more common with dopamine agonist therapy or uh, if the patient has a history of previous impulse control disorder or if they have a history of alcohol consumption or smoking. Um, so if the patient is exper experiencing excessive daytime sleepiness, sleepiness, they shouldn't drive, um, their medications should be adjusted to control the symptoms. And um, if that's still not uh, improving, um, then modafinil can be considered. Um, so if they're experiencing uh, orthostatic hypotension, then um, they would need to have a medication review once again to look at um, what could be done, or if the symptoms persist, then uh, you can give them uh, midodrine. And if they're experiencing excessive drooling, um, you can prescribe them glycopyronium bromide. Okay, so um, so anti-Parkinsonian medications are critical medications, so and they're time sensitive. So patients who miss the dose or receive late doses could experience uh, akinesia. Akinesia. So okay. So um, if you suddenly stop uh, Parkinsonian drugs, uh, what syndrome can it cause? Does anyone know? Yeah, so <laughs> neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So um, this is very important because it's life-threatening. So um, it, so neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it, this results from a deficiency of signaling uh, via the D2 dopamine receptors in the brain. Um, so sudden cessation of dopaminergic agents. Uh, it can also be caused by antipsychotics, but um, yeah, in this case, we're looking at sudden cessation. So um, we can use a mnemonic to remember the symptoms. So it's fever. So F for fever, E for encephalopathy, V for um, vitals uh, will be unstable. E will be for elevated enzymes. So creatinine kinase will be uh, elevated and R for rigidity of muscles. So this is very important to think about uh, before you stop the medication. Okay, so we'll do okay. a quiz to check your knowledge. So um, which neurotransmitter is primarily affected in Parkinson's? GABA, dopamine, and acetylcholine to the pool. Okay, okay. pause up, guys. <laughs> Okay, it's an easy question. Okay. 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 Okay, so most of you answered B. Yep, and it is dopamine. Um, so you're a junior doctor in a GP surgery and are asked to see an 84-year-old gentleman who's complaining of a tremor in his left hand. Um, what other features may suggest a diagnosis of Parkinson's? Uh, bradykinesia rigidity and rigidity, chorea and rigidity, um, chorea and nystagmus.
Okay, so most of you guys have said A. And yep, it is bradykinesia and rigidity. Remember the triad is the tremor, bradykinesia and rigidity. A 67 year old male diagnosed with Parkinson's is troubled by some non-motor symptoms. Which of the following sim symptoms are most likely to be related to Parkinson's? Visual blurring, mania, REM, sleep disturbance. Okay, so most of you have said C, REM sleep disturbance, and that is right. Okay, um, a 65 year old male presents nine months after being diagnosed with Parkinson's. On examination, he's found to have rigidity, a Parkinsonian gait, bradykinesia, unilateral resting tremor. He also has some hypomimia. The patient currently takes levodopa and benzerazide. And the neurologist now prescribes primipexol as well in order to keep the required dose of levodopa low. Um, what is the potential side effect of this patient's newly prescribed primipexol that they should be warned about? Compulsive gambling, blood vision, and or weight gain. Okay. So, okay, so some of you said C, weight gain. So the answer is A, compulsive gambling, because we remember we said, so primiprexol is a dopamine agonist, and with uh, dopamine agonist, the side effects are impulse control disorders, so compulsive gambling is an example of this, excessive daytime sleepiness and pulmonary uh, fibrosis, Weight gain is not associated with this. Usually it's usually associated with like steroids and things like that. And what's the other option? And it's uh, not blood vision either. Yeah. Um, drugs induced included. included in first line treatment of Parkinson's are levodopa and COM inhibitors, levodopa and dopamine agonists, uh, MAU inhibitors and amatidine. Okay, so most of you have said B, levodopa and dopamine agonist, and that is right. So remember for first line, um, it's levodopa, dopamine agonist, or uh, monoamine oxidized B inhibitors. Um, the COMT inhibitors and amatidine are for set up when, the treatments are, when the treatments are not um, effective anymore you add them on after they don't uh, you know you don't give them primarily by itself okay so um next question is which medication causes a pulmonary fibrosis
Okay, so we actually have a split between A and C. Um, so it's A, bromocryptine. So remember, dopamine agonists are the ones that cause pulmonary fibrosis, and that's bromocryptine. Okay, so um, a 68-year-old man presents to his GP with a one-year history of progress progressive slowing. He describes a general loss of dexterity, smaller handwriting, and his wife has described his face as being less expressive. He has noticed a subtle tremor in the left hand over the past few months, which is more pronounced when sat listening to the radio. On examination, he has masked five faces, mild left-sided bradykinesia, and cogwheel rigidity. Given the likely diagnosis, which finding points towards um, idiopathic disease rather than a drug-induced disease? So remember the difference between drug-induced and um, uh, oh. Parkinson's disease? Okay, so most people have said B, uh, asymmetrical symptoms, and that's right. Remember, doc, in drug-induced, in the symptoms are um, bilateral, whereas in um, Parkinson's disease, the symptoms are um, asymmetrical. So David, a 75-year-old man, is brought into your general practice clinic by his wife, Sally, who is concerned about his um, mobility and behavior. Over the last year, Sally has noted that David's movements have been much slower. He walks with a shuffling gait and has had a few recent falls. On examination, you notice that uh, David has a tremor. On assessing tone in his upper limbs, you notice um, cogwheel rigidity. Given the most likely diagnosis, which of the following answers best describe the tremor you are most likely to see? So this is a hard question, but um, just think about um, the tremor through the physical examinations that Irene mentioned. Okay, so most people said B, um, and that's right. You need, it's a unilateral tremor, which improves with voluntary movements, remember. Um, so rest, they have a resting tremor, and it's worse when stressed or tired, and it improves with voluntary movements. So, and it's asymmetrical. So it's often uh, unilateral worse in one side than the other. So next question, a 67 year old man with Parkinson's disease presents to the movement disorder clinic with worsening symptoms. He has a past medical history of hypertension, bipolar disorder and Parkinson's disease, though he's fit, uh, otherwise fit and well. His only regular medication is amlodipine. He complains that his tremor is now preventing him from getting dressed in the morning. And he recently had several falls when ambulating from the kitchen to the dining room. Uh, so, so several falls. What drugs would most likely would be what drug would most likely um, to improve his ability to perform activities of daily living?
Okay, so it's B, um, co-carol dopa. So remember the first line treatment uh, for motor symptoms that affect the patient's quality of life is uh, levodopa. And that is, so levodopa is combined uh, usually to make sure it gets to the brain and it's not broken down before, so it's B. So the last question, a 63 year old man complains of dystonia, chorea and apoptosis. These symptoms have been worsening and he notices it is worse a few hours after taking his medication. He's on medication for hypertension, Parkinson's and depression. What medication may have caused this? Okay, so the answer is C, levodopa. Remember, um, this is the one that causes um, dyskinesia when taken for a prolonged period of time. So dystonia, chorea, and apoptosis. Okay, and that's all. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, if, does anyone have any other questions? Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gareshma and Irene, for doing this talk for us. Uh, I hope you guys found it useful. I have put the feedback link form in the group chat so uh, people can quickly fill in the feedback form before you guys leave. It would be really nice, um, especially for these guys building their portfolios. Um, so, yeah, any feedback is welcome. And if you would like, um, if you have any recommendation of any talks that uh, you would like from us next, just let us know in the feedback forms you'll get a copy of the slides and a certificate of attendance if you fill it in and we have a question for you guys uh, okay. so the hurts is that so for pill rolling to, uh, tremor or resting tremor the hertz is 46 hertz just this just means that they do it 46 times per second if that's what you're asking Whereas yeah. an essential tremor. Um, yeah, so an essential tremor is five to eight, so it's um, faster than Parkinson's. If anyone has any other questions, please do put it in the chat. Yeah. We'll stick around for a few minutes just in case if anyone has any questions. But I've also put the um Instagram link if you guys want to follow us to keep um because we'll post which ones the upcoming talks and stuff on there with the link. So if you guys want to follow. Um yeah, tomorrow there'll be a talk on headaches just carrying on the neuro series, but we've been doing a mix of neuro, gastro and um, rest this season. So 